good morning, Freedom Church. Come on, somebody. Are you glad to be in God's house today? All right. Hey, real quick, let's welcome our campuses. Come on, Rising Sun, we love you guys. Middle River, love you. Come on, Lake Norman in the house today. Come on, love you guys so much. In your new building, all set up amazing. Floors are clean. It's incredible. Come on, Hot Springs. Come on, everybody. In Nairobi and those right up in your house and your PJs, we welcome you today as well. Today we're wrapping up this series that really came from a book uh, from Pastor Craig Rochelle. I'm so thankful for Life Church and, and his ministry. And this book really came at the right time for our church. And we're going to wrap that up today. We're pumped to have our students back from the DR. Come on. Love that. Amazing stories that happened there. And we, we love to invest in the next gen. And this next month is probably one of our most strategic months of investment as it relates to our students because we're having student camp. Can't wait for camp. Are you ready for camp? And honestly, we've been praying for the best camp possible location, and we could not have gotten a better. We're, we're moving our camp to North Bay right there on the Chesapeake. It's so amazing. And listen, here's a fun fact for the day. Our teams, our ministry teams, get to spend approximately about 40 hours a year with our students. But in the few days of camp, we get to spend over 60 hours in a few days with our students. And we believe here that life really kind of moves at the speed of relationships, which why we believe camp changes lives. And Last year, we saw over 80 students give their life to Jesus for the first time. 50 got baptized. Come on. And this year, it's our biggest camp yet. We're already at like a 300 students, and it's growing, right? And it's the largest camp that we've held as a church. So we're inviting you to be a part of the life change. So I want you to pray for us. Pray for our students. Pray for kids to, de to decide to follow Jesus to discover their identity in Jesus, believing that their calling and purpose will be very clear over those few days. And then finally, I want you to pray about supporting financially with a scholarship. Our kingdom builders have already made it possible for 35 students to attend camp, but with this explosion of growth, there are many more that are just having a hard time kind of raising the funds to get to camp. So you can simply quickly click on this QR code on the screen, enter it in. Any amount is amazing. I don't care how small it is or how big it is. It's going to bless someone's life and it direct it to camp. And this is what we get to do. We get to see Jesus change lives. Aren't you glad we're part of a transformational church? Come on, somebody. I love it. All right. You guys ready to dive in? All right. It's been a great few weeks as we've been talking about winning the war in our minds. So what do we know about winning the war in our minds? We know that most of life's battles are won and lost in the mind. We know it's almost impossible to have a positive life if you've got a negative mindset. How many have been around people, maybe lately, or maybe you know someone that's just, man, are you serious? You're always going down. You're always negative, negative Nelly, right? Come on, can we pick it up a little bit? Because living a positive life can be an issue when your mind is racing with negative thoughts. I wonder how many can relate to just having irrational thoughts where your thoughts just get away from you. I don't know what it would be for you. Maybe you worry about something and maybe it just seems normal what you're worrying about. Maybe you're a student. We're talking about students. Maybe you're a student and you're worried about making a bad grade on a test because if you know, if you make a bad grade, then you're worried you won't get into the right college. And if you don't get into the right college, you won't get the right job. And if you don't have the right job, you won't marry the right person. If you marry the wrong person, you'll have the wrong kids. And because they're the wrong kids, you got to get braces on their teeth. <laughs> braces are expensive and you want to put braces on them, but you're still paying for your college. And so your kids won't have the education. They're going to resort to a life of crime. They're going to go to prison. Then you're going to get a headache. And because you have a headache, now you have a brain tumor. You see what I'm talking about? It just runs away from you. You know, I'm exaggerating, but not by a lot. Maybe you're just overwhelmed with real feelings of anxiety and fear. And that's why I want to start today's message with the Word of God. How many are ready for the Word of God? All right. 
We're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 4, if you have your Bibles. The context is the Apostle Paul is writing from a Roman prison. He's awaiting potential execution, and he says these powerful words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He said, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, come on, think about those things. And the peace of God, the God of peace, will be with you. Today, I want to title this message today, Jesus, will you calm my anxious mind? Come on, is that your prayer today? Do, do, do you need Jesus just to come calm, calm your mind? Come on, let's pray together. Come on, Lake Norman, Rising Sun, Middle River. Come on, Nairobi. Come on, let's just pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, right now for this word. I thank you, God, that I, I am a vessel that you can work through. Holy Spirit, would you forever mark us. Let us leave differently. Let us forever be changed by your word. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. All right. Turn to your neighbor real quick and say, it's time to get some shalom in your dome. It's time to get some shalom up in the El Domo. Turn to your second choice and say, give me some peace. <laughs> give me some peace. Come on, can we talk about worry today? Can we talk about anxiety? Can we talk about our mind today? One last time as we conclude this series. If you remember a key thought from this series, the, the thought is this, that your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. And this is really good news if you're thinking helpful thoughts, you're thinking positive thoughts, right? But it's incredibly bad news if your thoughts are negative. So what do we know about the mind? We've been talking about both scripture and science, that God is the God of science. And in our mind, we know that there is this little almond-shaped portion of our brain known as the amygdala. Everybody say amygdala. If I've got to say these hard words, you have to say those hard words too. Come on, say it with me again. One, two, three. Amygdala. And the amygdala is an interesting little part of the brain that's shaped like a little almond, and it's part of the brain that's wired for survival. If you ever find yourself in a situation or a moment where you feel like, I need to fight or I need to flight, that's because your amygdala is actively engaged. Anytime you're in danger, this God little given portion of the brain this amygdala kicks in. It's sending your body strong doses of adrenaline, and it says, be on guard, flex up, be aware, run if you have to. You know what I'm saying? Like me, if you see a poisonous snake, if you see any snake, let me just be honest with you. It's, it's shoe soles and elbows. You know, like, I don't care if if you're my wife, I'm out of here. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm out. Like, I don't like snakes don't belong in the church. They don't belong in the yard. They don't belong anywhere. Can I get a good holla at your boy or somebody? Give me an amen. Give me a nod, right? If you're driving and a driver comes over on your lane and you're like, man, will you quit texting? Can you pay attention? Like your amygdala kicks in and says, be aware. Hey, wake up. Be alert. Be careful. You're in danger. If you have an alarm system in your house and it goes off in the middle of the night, what it kicks in, you begin to panic and it tells you, hey, be careful. Be careful. Wake up. There's something going on. God gave us this portion of our brain for our protection. The problem, though, is the amygdala is not objective. It's simply hardwired to protect, and it's very easily triggered. My personal story is I'm, I was raised in southeast Houston. In Houston, Texas, we get a lot of hurricanes, a lot of winds, a lot of storms, a lot of thunder. It seems like every time you turn around, there's flash flooding. It's crazy. It's like this big concrete bowl that just water can't get out fast enough. And I'm sure you've seen pictures. In fact, right now, there, there are storms that are going through that area. But that's why, like when I, last night, I don't know if you remember last night, but there was some thunder. There was some storms. And, and like, so when there's high winds, man, I get triggered. That's why our amygdala 
it needs a little help from this other thing that God's given us called the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is this logical part of our brain that tends to think logically. So if there's a great wind like last night, I wake up freaking out. My amygdala is saying, hey, you're going to die. But my prefrontal cortex calms me down and says, no, 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 wait, you're not going to die. There is a logical explanation. The amygdala is all panic. The prefrontal cortex is all logic. Are you tracking with me? Are you following with me? The problem is with the amygdala, it always responds according to pre-programming. In other words, if you had my experiences growing up, last night would have freaked you out, right? I don't know what it might be in your life. It may have been some hurt or some fear or some trauma, perhaps a misunderstanding or something that happened to you. And my guess is that there are certain people or places or events or some types of news that triggers you with feelings of anxiety and fear and tension. And without even knowing it, your mind can begin to race and run to a worst case scenario where you find yourself sometimes short of breath, you're panicking, you're having an attack, anxiety attack, and you're wondering, you're trying to control things that you can't control. We get completely overwhelmed by a runaway mind. Am I alone today? That's why Paul is writing from a Roman prison. He said, don't be anxious about anything. This could be a huge test. It could be a job interview. It could be your health situation. It could be a decision about your future. It could be a financial burden. It could be a recent trauma that has happened in your life. Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, in other words, if it's on your mind, then it's on God's heart. He cares about you more than you can imagine. God's love for you is more powerful than you can even think about. In every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, what do we do? You present your request to God, and when you give your burden to God, the Bible says that the peace of God, God's peace, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Jesus Christ. Can I get a good amen, somebody? Amen. But isn't it crazy how often as Christians we undervalue and we discount the power of prayer? We see it all the time. People, we get into situations, we get into the thick of it. We get into how life has just treated us and life has given us this deck of cards. And we're talking and someone will say, and I've heard it, you've heard it. Like, oh my goodness, man, all we can do now is pray. Like we, this is our last resort. All we can do now is pray. And I can almost imagine God saying, really? Like that's all you can do now? Like it, it, to the God who can move mountains, to the God who can raise the dead, to the God who can heal your body, to the God who can heal the sick, open blind eyes. Now all you can do to, to that God is now just your last resort is prayer. No, prayer is powerful. And as followers of Jesus Church, we have to recognize that prayer is never our last line of defense. It is always our first line of offense. Are you with me, somebody? In fact, the author of Hebrews said it like this, let us come boldly before the throne of grace. We come in prayer boldly with confidence to find help in our time of need. James said it like this, you don't have it because you haven't asked for it. You haven't prayed for it. Church, prayer is powerful. And not only does prayer move the heart of God, but prayer also changes the chemistry in our brain. Can I say that again? Not only does prayer move the heart of God, it changes the makeup in your brain. And this is so fascinating because for decades, neurologists believed that your brain didn't change after adolescence. How many are glad that your brain changed after adolescence? I'm so glad that my brain didn't stop at 15 years old. You, it stopped at 16 instead. Uh, you would be in real trouble. Our brain, though, continues to evolve and continues to change. It continues to rewire itself. And we talked about the neural pathways that when you think a thought, it's easier to think that thought again because our brains are constantly and continually changing. In fact, the term is called, I hope I get this word right, neuroplasticity. And that means that it's constantly evolving and rewiring itself. And what I've become, I've loved to become just studying this thought called neurotheology. It's the study of the mind and of God. It's also known as spiritual neuroscience. And 
what neurotheology does. It studies the relationship between the, the, the brain and a belief in God. And here's what research now shows that it shows that prayer actually changes your brain. In fact, Dr. Caroline Leaf in her book, Switch on Your Brain, she says a powerful quote about the brain in prayer. She says that it's been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. Isn't that amazing? It's interesting that not only does prayer touch the heart of God, but prayer changes the makeup of the brain. Just as toxic and negative thoughts harm your brain, prayer heals your brain. It transforms your brain. It literally renews your mind. Why do we worry? Why do we find ourselves so anxious? As followers of Jesus, church, we should completely trust in God. Why is it that our minds think irrational thoughts? Well, science would tell us in many ways that we're experiencing a amygdala hijack. Our little amygdala that's wired to protect says, I'm in trouble, I better take control, I've gotta work harder, I better stay up until two in the morning and worry about this because if I don't, it's only gonna get worse. So science would say that we're experiencing amygdala hijack, but the Bible would say that our mind is dominated by sinful thinking. In fact, if you, if you wanna just get real today, what is the definition of worry? A simple definition of worry is this. It is the sin of distrusting the promises of God and the power of God. Can I say it again? Worry is the sin of distrusting the promises and the power of God. It's essentially saying, God, I don't trust you. In this moment, what I'm walking through, I don't believe in your goodness. I, I don't believe that, you're, that you care about what I care about. I don't believe that you're going to come through for me. I'm going to worry about this because ultimately, I don't feel like you're working on my behalf and I just really don't trust you in this moment. And so instead of letting my sinful nature control my mind, which is so, it can, it can happen so easily in all of our lives, what I want to do as a follower of Jesus, I want to choose to let my spirit direct my thinking. Instead of letting my sinful nature run my mind in all sorts of directions, I'm going to choose to let the Holy Spirit, which dwells within me, to direct my thinking. I'm going to let the logical part of my brain choose that which is spiritual. I'm going to take my prefrontal cortex and say, I'm going to think on what is true. I'm going to think on what is excellent. Wait, I am going to think on what is praiseworthy. I'm going to put my trust completely in God. In fact, here's how scripture says it in Romans 8. Again, it's the apostle Paul. He says, those that are dominated by the sinful nature, what happens? You think about sinful things. When your mind is dominated by your sinfulness, your mind begins to drift toward things that are dishonoring to God, you think about sinful things. But those, come on somebody, who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, we think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature, nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. How many want some peace today? That's why we're gonna take as a church every thought captive and we're gonna make it obedient to Jesus. From a scientific standpoint, for all of you people that have to have a logical answer, we're going to let our prefrontal cortex grab the amygdala by the tail, and we're going to say, you quit being irrational. We're going to choose to be spiritual. We're going to give this thing to God right here, right now. I'm choosing God by faith. I'm trusting in you. I'm going to believe in you. I'm going to give you my burden. And even when my irrational thoughts and fears start to run wild, I'm going to stop. I'm going to grab that thought. I'm going to take it captive, and I'm going to make it obedient to Jesus. Amen. We're going to choose intentionally to let the Holy Spirit direct our thoughts. In fact, we all have worries, don't we? All of us. We bring our worries. And one by one, we put our worries into our worry box. Things you're going through, your teenagers. How many got some teenagers in the house? Those are worthy to worry about. Your job, your situation, the thing, your marriage, your finances, we put them into this worry box. But the good thing is, as a Christ, we're not alone, right? We, we have a God. We have a God. And sometimes we'll take our worries and we'll take them and we'll put them into our God box. 
and we'll wait about five minutes and God hasn't done anything. We're like, oh, we run to our God box and we take the worry back out and we put it back into our own personal worry box. God, you, you didn't show up when I need you to, needed you to show up. You didn't, you didn't do what I thought you were gonna do. God, if you're so good, if you're so loving, then why did this happen? Then I'm gonna take these thoughts and I'm gonna take them from the God box and I'm gonna put them back into my worry box. And I think the problem is, is your worry box is too big, but your God box is too small. And what we really need is we need a bigger God and we need smaller worry. Amen. Amen. And I, actually, I would encourage all of us to go home and get a shoebox. For some of you that can grab me at the third service, you can just take this one home with you. Um, but when you start to think about things, you need to write these thoughts down and put them into your God box. Put them underneath your bed. Put them in a closet. When you start to think these things about your life, when you start to think these things about maybe God, when you start to think things about your circumstance, write them down and put it into your God box. And here's, what, here's the exercise that I feel like is so symbolic. When you start choosing to dwell and worrying about the things that you're not meant to worry about, I want you to go to your God box and I want you to literally take out the worry and take it back on yourself. Like, God, I'm taking this away from you right now because I choose to worry. I choose to walk in this path. I choose to let my thoughts, my irrational thoughts get the best of me. Because we're essentially taking back the very thing that we gave to God. Why, why do we do this? The reason is, is that your God is too small and your worries get too big. And someone, all of us, we need a bigger God in this moment that we're walking in and smaller worry. Can I get a good amen, somebody? <clears throat> I want to shift, and I'm probably going to land the plane on this sermon. And this has been a great series. I feel like God has really used it. But as we close today, I want to give you, and here, it's my philosophy. I want, and I pray that you can adopt these things, these tools in your life. But I want to give you three things, three big thoughts on how we're going to conclude getting our mind right, getting our heart right, getting our life in alignment to all things God. Are you with me? Number one, first is I'm going to do what I can do. I can do what I can do. I want to do what I can do. I plan on doing what I can do. In other words, students, if you've got an exam coming up, you're not just going to say, you know what, I'm going to put this test in the God box and I hope I do well. No, you got to study. Like if you want a paycheck on Friday, you're like, I'm just not going to show up to work. God, you're going to provide. No, you got to get up and you got to go to work. Are you with me, somebody? If you want to get in better shape, man, I'm working on this. You're not, I'm not just going to pray about my health. I'm praying about it, but I'm also going to try to eat better. I'm going to get to the gym and we're going to get some good advice, some good coaching, some good counsel. But why? Because we're going to do what we can do. The second thing is we're going to give to God what we can't do. I'm going to give to God what I can't do. If I can't do something, then I'm going to trust God with it. I'm giving to God what I can't do. I'm going to do what I can do, but I'm going to give to God what I can't. And finally, my third point is this. I'm going to trust God no matter what because of who he is, because of his character, because of his nature. So God, I'm going to do what I can do. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give to you what I can't. And no matter what, because of your goodness, because of your promises, because of your character, because of your faithfulness, I'm going to trust you no matter what. I, I man, I'm calling people to this morning to this level of trust. To trust God no matter what. No matter what's happened to you, no matter what you've been walking through. And listen, there's some people in this space today, you, man, they've been walking through it. There have been some things that have happened that are beyond words, beyond emotion, beyond, beyond anything that we could ever describe. But it's in these moments where we say, God, we trust you regardless. I'm gonna trust you no matter what. I'm gonna trust you through the pain. I'm gonna trust you through the turmoil. I'm gonna trust you through this, this aching hurt in my heart. I'm gonna trust you through the loss. I'm gonna trust you through the trauma. I'm gonna trust, God, I trust you no matter what. You're good, you're righteous, you're holy, you're faithful. 
And what I want us to do for this next just few moments, just can you imagine with me just a life of peace? A life of unending joy, just trusting the Lord. Can I tell you it's possible? It's not only possible, but it's a choice. It's a choice that you have to make. We're either, we're either dominated by a sinful nature or we're dominated by the Spirit. You're dominated by the flesh or you're dominated by the Holy Spirit. So let's review this series. If your life is moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts, do you like the direction that your thoughts have taken you? And if I'm just honest, for so long my thoughts have always been, Wade, you're never going to be able to do this. You're not good enough. We know the truth. You're never going to measure up. You don't have what it takes. I can't keep up with all that's going on. I'm always over, you know, overwhelmed. And here's the deal. Here's the truth. If you don't control what you, what you think, you will control. You will never control the outcome. If you don't control what you think, you will never control what you do. So what are we doing? We're taking, we're identifying the stronghold. Remember we talked about strongholds? What is a stronghold? It's a lie. Whatever that lie is that we believed. And some of us, we need to track back to six years old, seven years old, eight years old, where we attached ourselves to a lie and it has set the trajectory of our life ever since we were a small child. That dominant lie where our spiritual enemy has been talking us out of the truth of God. And when we identify what that lie is, we can replace it with truth. Not just a practical truth, but a spiritual truth from God. What do we do with this truth? What do we, what do we even talk? We're going to write it down. We're going to write that truth down. We're going we're gonna to think on that truth, and we're going to confess it till we believe it. We're going to write it down. We're going to think about it, and we're going to confess it until it's true. So what do I declare in my life? Where does my mind need to be renewed? Let me tell you that Jesus is first, that I exist to serve and glorify him that I am disciplined, that Christ in me is stronger than the wrong desires in me. What am I doing? I'm gonna write that down. I'm gonna think about those things and I'm gonna believe it. I'm I'm growing closer to Jesus every day. Because of Jesus, my family is closer, my body is stronger, my faith is deeper, and my leadership is sharper. I am creative, I'm innovative, I'm driven, I'm focused, I'm blessed beyond measure because the Holy Spirit of God dwells within me. Come on, let's declare the truth. We write it down, we think about it, we confess it until we believe it. We're renewing our minds with truth. Let's all stand, everybody. Come on, Lake Norman. Come on, Hot Springs. Come on, Rising Sun. We're standing. So what is true about me? That's the question. What is true? Well, if you don't know what's true about you, let me declare it. You're not a hostage to your unhealthy thoughts because the weapons you fight with are not the weapons of this world. Your spiritual weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds. What do we do? By the power and the authority of God, you demolish every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Worry is not your master. Why? Because you trust in God. His peace guards your mind. His peace guards your heart in Christ Jesus. You're not a slave to your habit. You're not a prisoner to your addiction. You're an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and by the word of your testimony. Come on, somebody. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And what's so powerful is that we're not interpreting God through our circumstances. Like some of us, we're walking through some hard times right now. We're not saying, God, where are you? You're not good because my life is bad. No, that's not what we're doing. We're interpreting our circumstances through the goodness of God. And as followers of Jesus, we cover everything we do in prayer. And we're not going to be anxious about anything but in everything with prayer and petition. We take our request to God and the peace of God, the God of peace, not the peace of this world. The world can't give it to you and the world can't take it away. It's the peace of God, which transcends all human understanding. will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Come on, can we worship Him today?
Come on, we celebrate this truth. We thank you, Jesus. You're so good. You're so good. You're so good. In Jesus' name.